All right, welcome everybody. I'm sorry there was confusion about getting things started. Um, just a couple administrative preliminaries. Let's go ahead and at least try that when you have questions, you raise your hand. If you're the type that forgets your questions, you can go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, but feel free to kind of interrupt me. I chose to do this lecture synchronously because I prefer uh, the kind of back and forth instead of just lecturing at you. Um, although I do get the value of asynchronous at times, but um, I would, I think it'll go faster and go better if you all ask questions as we have them. Um, but you know, how, what, you know, and so if you, if you raise your hand, I'll try to call on you pretty much anytime. Um, but if, you know, if you want to throw it in the chat, that's okay too. At some point, I'll kind of go back through the chat and try to answer questions that you all have. <clears throat> this is the advanced counterplan lecture. And I think, you know, on any debate topic, counterplans are important. But on this topic in particular, for the negative, this is either a critique topic or a counterplan topic. The disadvantages are mostly horrible. Um, the, the moral leverage of the affirmative will be really high in some instances because they get to talk about issues of racism. And if you don't have a counter plan or a critique that deals with that, those particular issues, it's, it's going to be hard to win. Um, also, if you haven't heard already, the topic is likely very, very, very big. Um, we'll probably talk more about this, but there are there's at least five different topics that have either been in high school or college topics. And this topic includes virtually all of the affirmatives from all of those topics. Like for example, the immigration topic, it's possible that 75, if not more percent of the affirmatives that were topical on the immigration topic are also topical under this topic, along with the surveillance topic that was several years back that, most of the affirmatives, if not all the affirmatives on that topic are topical under this topic. And so you need the, the counter plan or the critique to deal with such a wide diversity of affirmatives. And because the affirmative has the moral leverage of being able to claim very, very important uh, sol solvency for very, very important things like racism. Um, so the so hopefully this lecture will kind of start the process of getting ready to debate counterplans on this topic and we're going to kind of start with a quick review of the basics of counterplans um and i may also i will just kind of tell you in advance i know that most of you have have chilled your video feeds um but i i may still call on you and we'll just wait a second to see how far we go just to see if we're all kind of in the same place so um let's see let's Let's just start with kind of, if you're taking notes, let's make the first set of notes, the basics of counterplans. Counterplans need three things. When you start a debate, if you're, you know, you, you always wanna either be working with your coach or with your partner and talking about, and if it's not clear already, you should know that your counterplan has text, it has evidence to support the solvency of the counterplan, or at least an argument that's incredibly intuitive. Like most of the time we want to have solvency evidence. And it would be in particular nice if you had a solvency advocate that explicitly advocated the counterplan, and then you need a net benefit. And so before a debate even starts, if you can't answer the questions of what exactly does the text of our counterplan say, what evidence do we have to support that the counterplan solves the affirmative? and you don't have a clear vision of what your net benefit is, then you're, you don't really have a good counter plan. So let's now talk about the text. So I, I just wanna kind of start by saying that the text of the counter plan, much like the text of the plan is incredibly important. So we had a debate a few years back, maybe the quarterfinals of the Green Hill tournament, you know, and it's either the quarters or the semis, I forget. And after the debate was over, uh, you know, we kind of said, how did the debate go? And the debaters were like, yeah, mistakes were made, which is a little bit of a common phrase at St. Mark's when things didn't go exactly like we wanted. I was like, what happened? It felt like when we left the room, you know, we, we had a good strategy. We knew what the app was. Things were good. And they're like, yeah, we might have messed up the text of the counter plan a little bit. And and that ended up being true and we lost on a 2-1. And we talked about it later as we do, 
you know, kind of reviewing what went wrong. Um, we're big on shared responsibility. Like, you know, both of the debaters talked about how they should have been more careful, but also the coaches were like, you know, there were two coaches there and neither one of us bothered to check the text of the counter plan. And we made a relatively minor error, but you know, when you're debating at big national tournaments against good teams, if you make minor errors, they're usually going to figure it out and exploit that. And, you know, not writing it a, you could say that by definition, a minor error in writing of the text of your counter plan is never a minor error. It's a big error. And so you want to be really careful. Now, on the other hand, the, the kind of second part of tips about writing the text of your counter plan is a lot of times you can be big. You could be a big counter plan as long as you're very clear as to what the net benefit is. So just as an, an example, if you're debating um, the mental or the treatment affirmative, there are a lot of different things that you could do in addition to legalization that can help solve the affirmative. And in most instances, our net benefit to the counter plan with legalization is going to be something like that health trade-off disadvantage that's in the one and C. And so if you start with, okay, what, what is our counter plan trying to accomplish? Actually, and I'm going to stop here for just a second and refer back to one of the other lectures. For those of you that were in Nick's lecture the other day about how to think about debate, he talked about offense and defense. And one of the other things he talked about was all affirmatives start with, here's a problem, here's what we should do to fix it. Okay, well, the point of a counter plan is to be a very, very good defensive argument that is about maybe there's a problem, you don't have the right way to fix it. Once we start from that premise, then we're saying, okay, what kind of counter plan are we going to have to fix this problem? What's the real problem with the affirmative? Well, the real problem that the affirmative is trying to address, and this is why I wanted to reference Nick's lecture, is start there. What's that problem? Well, in that instance, the, the problem is drug addiction. Is really the best way to solve drug addiction to take people after they've taken drugs, after they've committed crimes, either because of their drug use or as, a, as an effect of their drug use, and then send them to a treatment court. It seems like that's three, four, five, six, a thousand steps down the line, and that we could intervene in a bunch of other places before they ended up committing crimes, which would be so much better for society. So if you think that legalization is the problem, that counter plan is a, is a really good idea. But it's probably not the only problem. And if we legalize, would that mean that nobody is addicted to drugs? Probably not. So let's try to think of some other things we might do. What if we made it so insurance had to cover drug treatment programs? We could pass a law that does that. We could just provide massive funding for drug treatment programs. You can add as many of those things as you want to your counter plan to make your counter plan more effective. And the only thing you have to worry about is what's our net benefit? Well, one of the net benefits is uh, your elections disadvantage. And right now, the links to your elections disadvantage are if it looks like it's a crime-based proposal. Well, you know, if, it's, if Trump is seen as improving the criminal justice system, would legalize, legalizing drugs cause that? Probably. So maybe that's not a very good net benefit, which brings us back to the other net benefit that I referenced, which is our health trade-off disadvantage. And given that that disadvantage is related to the amount of funding that we provide, maybe we need to be careful about how much funding our counter plan does. And so some of those things that I talked about, you may want to add to your counter plan, and some of them you may not, depending on what you think your net benefit to that counter plan is. If, um, if you just wanted to do a big treatment affirmative and not do the legalization part, then you might be easier to spend elections as a net benefit. If you don't spend any money, then the trade-off disadvantage is more likely to be a net benefit. And so when you're writing your text, I think a lot of times we can have what I would call big counter plans, meaning they do a bunch of different things, as long as always you're thinking to yourself, what is the net benefit to this counter plan? And that's always a good question when you're talking to your partner about negative strategy and a counter plan 
is what do you think the net benefit to this counter plan is? All right, I'm gonna stop there and see if anybody has any questions, if um, you're clear on that stuff or, or, and I can go on, or you have things you wanna say. And I'm gonna get a drink of water. Okay, no questions so far. And, and that kind of um, has clarified the main, like if you're taking notes, the short version of this section, which is the writing the text of the counter plan is be big, just be very clear as to what the net benefit is. One little phrase I forgot that I like to throw in counter plans is the phrase including but not limited to. So we're going to address issues of drug addiction via legalization, including but not limited to X, Y, Z. That way, if your opponents are like, wait, you didn't include this, and be like, oh, are we say including but not limited to. Now that's not an all, a catch all of no matter what they say, you can just be like, oh yeah, you're right. We also do a no first use policy. Like that's not relevant to legalization, but there might be other things that are basically related to legalization that you did not specify. Maybe it's included in your 1NC evidence or a 2NC card that you read, something like that, that legalization would include things. The other point about this was be careful. Writing the, your counterplan text is incredibly important. You don't want to make mistakes about that. You want to review it. You want to have you know, your partner look at it. You look at it. If you have a coach that can look at it, you want, you want to be careful. And at the, you want to have a clear vision of what it does and it doesn't accomplish. Um, Sometimes some counter plans, their goal is not to solve all of the affirmative. They are just to, they're just to solve um, one advantage or two advantages. You know, it kind of depends on that situation. Um, okay, so we have the first question. Max asked, is the net benefit usually disadvantage? And that is perfect because that is the segue into the final part of the basic section, which is what is the net benefit? So Max has indicated that the net benefit and is often the disadvantage. That is correct. Um, but there are other things. Can anybody else, either this one you can throw to check because I'm looking at my chat window instead of my notes, or you can raise your hand if you want to talk about it. What, what other possibilities are there? What else could it be? So like we know the disadvantages net benefit. Okay, so Callie says it could be an internal net benefit. That, that's right. Sometimes like legalizing drugs would have other benefits besides just solving the affirmative. And so you could read that. Um, Generally speaking, permutations solve those, but there are definitely tricky counter plans. And so, and, and that's kind of a little bit of a language thing that if you haven't already adopted this, normally speaking, when I ask you, what is the net benefit to your counter plan? It is assumed that the affirmative team will make a permutation. It's the most important argument when we get to the affirmative strategy tips. It's gonna be very first that we talk about that you should almost always make a permutation. And so we're going to assume that our opponents will make a permutation. And therefore, if Callie tells me that the net benefit to her legalization counter plan is all of the other good things that legalization would accomplish, I'm gonna say, well, that's not really a net benefit because the 2AC is gonna say permutation and it will accomplish all of those things. Now, there are some tricky counter plans. And, and if your counter plan is truly mutually exclusive, mutually exclusive like if the affirmative was like, we're gonna increase penalties for marijuana use and your counter plan is to legalize marijuana use, those are mutually exclusive and you, you can have internal net benefits to that that they really most of the time can't perm if it's truly mutually exclusive, but very few counter plans are truly mutually exclusive. What else could be a potential net benefit to a counter plan? I've got four on my list and I see two. Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? All right. So a critique can often be a net benefit to a counter plan. Now, sometimes the, the distinction between a critique alternative and a counter plan is, is a little thin, um, but there are definitely times. So if I could see on this topic where there could be some arguments about treatment courts, for example, that they're still a part of the overall criminal justice system, like as opposed to legalization. And you could have a critique that is about the way that we view drug use should not ever be in a criminal way. And even if you make treatment courts an option, it's still just an option and they're still subject to the disciplinary power 
of the court system? And if so, that's a bad way to look at the world. That's a bad way to look at, at drug use. And instead, legalization says if people want to use drugs, they, sh they should be able to make those choices for themselves and make determinations um, as opposed to being kind of locked into this, um, you know, that there's never a good medical use for marijuana, for example, or there's a whole bunch of different legitimate uses for uh, some drugs that are currently considered illegal. And that's a bad way to look at the world. And so the affirmative, it's still a crime. And it's not like the treatment court is voluntary. You have to go there. If you commit a crime, the affirmative, all they do is say, well, if you want, you can opt into a drug treatment court, but it's not optional. And if you refuse to do it, then they're prob you're probably going to end up in regular court and you're going to end up in jail. And so that's the critique could say that's a bad way to look at the world. The other potential net benefit, um, which is kind of can be divided into two, is you could either link turn or impact turn one of the affirmative advantages. So if an affirmative team has, uh, you know, that we, we, can, we can just keep using the treatment courts affirmative as an example. And you can say that the affirmative reads both the cartel and manufacturing advantages. And instead of, uh, you can do legalization and say that that will resolve the drug treatment problem that is um, causing manufacturing to go down, but it won't resolve profits from the uh, cartels and doesn't solve that advantage. And then you could read arguments about why terrorism is good. Basically, you are impact turning that advantage. And so you could have a counter plan. And again, this is a relatively common strategy where the, the affirmative has two or three advantages and the negative has a counter plan that solves two of those three advantages, but then they impact turn the third advantage. And then the net benefit to their counter plan is those impact turns. Uh, any questions about that? All right, good question, Max. Thank you for moving me right along in my lecture. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is your strategy for the summer slash the year as we go into the year. So normally, I would suggest that you find one or two counter plans and really dig in on those counter plans and just be as good as you can possibly be on those counter plans. The, the problem is, this topic is so big that one kind of counter plan just isn't going to work all the time for you. And so I'm not going to talk much about the state's counter plan because there's going to be separate lectures just about the state's counter plan. But that is definitely one that you want to have in your counter plan arsenal. The problem, and it can solve a lot of affirmatives. And in, in my lecture, I'm going to actually talk about how if you're really strategic about it, it can solve. 99% of the affirmatives. The problem is you have to be really strategic about it and you have to be really good at writing your counterplan text. And sometimes people are going to break a new affirmative against you and you're just not going to have time to figure out all of the ways that the states could solve that particular affirmative. And so it's, there are just going to be times where that's not good enough and you're going to want to have other counterplans. And so should you spend some time on the state's counter plan and be ready to debate that during the year? Absolutely. Should you attend the lecture about the state's counter plan? Absolutely. But should you just think, oh, I have the state's counter plan, I'll be good. I don't, I don't think that that's going to turn out to be the case. Um, and so what I think you should do during camp is spend a lot of time on the state's counter plan and then pick one or two other counter plans that you're going to kind of become an expert on and then and then when the summer ends, so in, and you move into the year, as you start to find out about other affirmatives, you start to write specific counter plans that you don't spend very much time on. You, you find a couple of good solvency cards for them. You have a clear net benefit and you have a good link that is distinct from what the counter plan accomplishes. So you're, so you're sure about what your net benefit is and you spend a few hours getting that counter plan ready to use and then you move on to the next affirmative and find another counter plan against a different affirmative. And eventually you'll kind of start to have a very, you know, you'll have a healthy arsenal of counter plans to use against a variety of different aff of affirmatives. And you can kind of always rely on, on the state's counter plan. Um, let me see, I'm just checking my notes real quick to see if there's anything else I wanted to say about the state's counter plan. 
before I go on. Um, yeah, the the you're going to want to have a good basis of knowledge about the state's counter plan when you leave uh, GDS, but you're so that you don't have to spend time working on that when things uh, when when you start to have time to do specific research and the state's counter plan can be kind of a fail safe for you that you can use in a lot of instances, but you also want to do um, you, you want to kind of get that taken care of during the summer so you can move on to other counter plans. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's talk about another type of counter plan, which is, so we just kind of talked about the affirmative has to defend federal government action. So the state is an obvious counter plan that you could use, but let's talk about some of the other agent counter plans. In some instances, you can also use a different branch of the government. So, um, as I said before, if you haven't already heard, this topic includes very large portions of several previous high school and college topics, the courts topic, the legalization topic, the surveillance topic, the immigration topic, etc. The most common counter plans from those topics are things you should have in your counter plan arsenal. So some variation of executive action, like executive self-restraint or executive order or agency's counter plans are all things that you should have a working knowledge of so that you can create counter plans. So and the biggest kind of trick to this is that there will be times where you can use the word in act because the, the topic uses the word in act and there is evidence that says that an act requires congressional action which means if you can lock the affirmative in to defending congress as a part of their as a part of their plan you can then say Sorry, a couple people just need to be admitted. Um, if the affirmative is stuck defending Congress, you can say, you know what, we're not gonna do any congressional legislation, and instead, we are going to have the president take action to solve these problems. Does anybody know what possibly our net benefit could be to that? Feel free to throw that in the chat. Yes, Callie, quicker. Oh, it's quicker. Sorry, Callie. Um, that is, um, it is true that it might be quicker, uh, but generally fiat resolves the quicker issue. And additionally, the, um, uh, the permutation would probably resolve that too, right? Remember, yeah, Jack said it avoids partisan backlash. The most common net benefit to this counter plan is that um, is some type of congressional action disadvantage, which generally speaking is politics. Like it avoids Congress having to use political uh, capital in order to pass this particular bill. And that means that the, um, the executive order and, the, and in particular, this topic, um, I could see it being particularly vulnerable to what was popular on the immigration topic, which is a lot of times the affirmative will say, the government is doing all of these bad things. And who's most responsible for those bad things? The executive branch. Well, why don't we just have the head of the executive branch, the president, stop doing those bad things and or stop his people that he's hired from doing those bad things. Okay, we for some reason, we have a bunch of people that have just gotten the link and have just started showing up. And, and I actually kind of like to take a break every 25 minutes anyway. So we're gonna take a five minute break. It is 6.39, we'll make it six minutes, come back at 6.45 and we'll kind of re refresh quite quickly the um, executive self-restraint kinds of counter plans. And then we will move into another area. So six minute break, be back at, I'm sorry, I said probably said 6.45, but I really meant 7.45 Eastern. I'm in Dallas, so 6.45 my time, 7.45 your time. Um, and then we will resume. Thank you. And if you have any questions, throw those in the chat because I'll take a look at them before we start back up. All right, it's 6.45 Dallas time, 7.45 on the East Coast, and we're back. Um, 
we were just talking about the in act topicality argument and how that argument can be used in order to set up the executive self-restraint counter plan or the executive order counter plan or an agency's counter plan that could also set up the court's counter plan. Um, and I actually kind of think going into the topic, this is definitely one of those areas where when you start the year, you should have a version of the court's counter plan. You should have a version of executive self-restraint or executive order counter plan. And you might even want to have the Congress counter plan um, because I suspect there will be some teams that read uh, court apps. And um, of course, the problem with that is if you think that the topic disadvantages are bad, the disadvantages against Supreme Court action are equally, if not worse. Um, kind of depends. And honestly, as I, as I started the lecture with, the, this is a counter plans topic because the disadvantages are so bad. If the, if the negative doesn't have a lot of counter plans that can solve most of the affirmative, they're going to be in serious trouble. Um, go ahead, Callie. Sorry, you were a little quiet. Say it one more time and I've turned up my volume so I can hear you hopefully. How would a court's act enact an act? Yeah, so, so, so the enact topicality violation is going to get some, um, you know, use this year and that a lot of people are going to try to use that mainly because the topic is so big. Um, but that is hardly a consensus definition. And my suspicion is that early in the year, teams will be really successful with enact topicality, but by the second or third tournament, affirmatives will have gotten better about debating that and they will not be stuck defending that action, particularly against a counter plan that tries to use the executive or tries to use um, the Supreme Court. And so the, there are just gonna be lots of good cards for the affirmative to say, the Supreme Court, like in a very theoretical sense, the, the Supreme Court doesn't enact things, but in reality, they enact things all of the time. And, and certainly the executive branch enacts things all of the time. And so are there definitions that says enact means legislation and has to be done by the Congress? Yes. Do I consider those definitions to be the consensus of the literature? No. Do I consider those arguments to be particularly good? No, it'll, it is what I've called it is a measure of desperation that the topic is so big, people will say the only chance that the negative has is if they can go for the enact argument. Does anybody, so as we're talking about that, can anyone throw in the chat the primary affirmative argument? Like what's the best argument against enact meaning congressional action that the affirmative can make? Anyone out there? So some of the things, let's see, Callie, because the courts make precedents that, yeah, that is definitely along the line of what I was thinking about. That's, that's a good example of it. And parts of the topic, so like policing definitely seems subject to congressional legislation. And in theory, Congress can do things with forensic science and can do things with um, sentencing but the courts are really the ones that are in charge of sentencing. And so while the Congress can pass legislation that affects the way that sentencing happens, that, that it, it almost makes more sense. And so the topic has a little bit of a contradiction and a little bit of tension in it, in that there are parts of the topic, like forensic science, like federal forensic science is being done by the executive branch. And so it's, a, it's a, just a really weird place for the Congress to be enacting legislation that affects those areas. They're just not the optimal actor and they're not the actor that is what I guess I would consider to be normal means. And so in that sense, I think that the affirmative will, will those are, that is one way that they'll, they'll do that. And so I think at times, I think that the negative will be more effective by saying, Yes, the topic says United States federal government, which is also another affirmative argument. The affirmative will be like, look, they, if they real, if the people who wrote the topic really wanted us to just talk about Congress and we really had to defend Congress, 
then they wouldn't have put the United States federal government in the topic. They would have put the United States Congress should enact criminal justice reform, et cetera. And so, so that leads me to this point, which is I think that sometimes the negative might be in a better spot instead of reading a topicality violation about enact. Instead, when the affirmative plan says the United States federal government, the negative should just read either the, the Congress, the, the executive action counter plan or the Supreme Court counter plan or some variation of the court's counter plan. And then when the 2AC says permutation do the counter plan, then say you can't do permutation do the counter plan because the word in act means Congress. And yes, the topic says United States federal government, but that just means you get to fiat more than Congress. Like you have to at minimum fiat Congress. Um, and you can stop there if you want, but you're also, in order to make sure that you don't lose to circumvention arguments, like Congress will pass legislation and then the president will just ignore it, which he he's common, commonly does these days. Um, you are allowed to fiat that the executive branch and the Supreme Court will comply with that congressional action, but at minimum, you have to use Congress. And so that kind of answers the permutation to do the counter plan in one fell sweep, not with just the topicality argument, because if you read it as an off case topicality argument, the 2AC is gonna probably make a lot of different arguments against it, and that is gonna make this counter plan null and void. And so you're better off to kind of hold that debate back until the after the 2AC says permutation due to counter plan. And you never know, they might not say permutation due to counter plan. They might just defend Congress and other actors, and then you got your counter plan. So uh, any questions about that? I know that that's a little bit complicated, so uh, uh, feel free to throw it in the chat or raise your hand. All right, looks like we're good. So. One of the strategies about setting up counter plans um, I wanted to talk about next, and that is that you want to use cross X to effectively set up your counter plans. And the way I'm going to refer back to that stuff I talked about before, which I'll review because I know we have some people that, that just got here. And that is, I referred back to Nick in his lecture talking about how affirmatives have two things. One, a harm that they then try to solve, okay? The counter plan is trying to neutralize the harm by solving that problem in a different way. Well, what is at the real core of the problem? So with our drug treatment affirmative, the real problem is that people get addicted to drugs. So if you ask questions about that and get at the heart of what the real problem is, you are setting up your counter plan. Now, if you just say, you know, you, you have to be a little bit sly about this. If you're just like, isn't the real problem with your advantage drug addiction, you know, they might fall for that the first time, but after that, they're going to be on to, you're going to be reading counterplans about that and they're going to be more clever. So you have to be a little bit sly with the way that you ask these questions. But, and sometimes you can do that by acting like you're really just trying to understand what they're talking about. Like, uh, one ACs love to let you know how smart they are and how they know all this stuff and, th and they're happy to edu educate you about their affirmative. And so setting up counter plans is a good time to let them educate you because once they've educated you, you can counter plan with the education that they provided and, and now they, they might be in a bit of a tricky spot. Um, the other really useful trick that I like is to read the un-underlying parts of their solvency advocate. So often the solvency advocates will support, they'll support the plan, but the affirmative has kind of had to change the wording. Anyone in my uh, 39 participants know why? Why wouldn't the affirmative just use their solvency ad advocate exactly like the solvency advocate says their plan should be done? So David said it might not be about the United States federal government. That's definitely true. And if so, then that's, that's really good for us. Um, but the, um, in, in fact, I, I will, I will, I will mention that David was kind of working on the legalization affirmative. And unfortunately, most of the evidence he found 
early on was about other states. And so in that instance, like their psalms, the advocates definitely said that Texas should legalize drugs. And I think the other one was Washington should legalize drugs. And the parts about the United States federal government were quite thin. That this, in fact, David could not have helped me more with that answer because that's the exact reason why we, we read the un underlying parts of their solvency evidence. And even if David had made the word Texas in two point font, we hit control A, select all of it and make it 12 point. And then we say, oh, this works quite well with our state's counter plan. And you have actually read solvency evidence for us, um, not for your, your plan. Uh, Jack says, it might not use the word should or something synonymous. Yeah, that's true um, for sure. Um, and, and we're almost always going to put the word should in our plan. But what I was thinking about is that sometimes in order to be topical, they can't do exactly what the solvency advocate says. So I referenced earlier that a big chunk of the immigration topic might be topical um, on this topic. And a big chunk of the, there was a, a college topic that was about legalization, which included things like legalization of marijuana. Um, I, I don't really remember, I was, I'm a, I was a high school coach at that time, but, and so I'm kind of only vaguely aware of that topic. But, um, and the thing about legalization that's interesting is this topic does not explicitly allow legalization. So, but what you can do is you could, like let's just say the affirmative was, and the solvency advocate said, we should legalize marijuana. The use, and even if it said the United States federal government, if it said, if it, if it uh, resolved both David and Jack's concerns, that it says the United States federal government should legalize marijuana. Well, the topic doesn't say you can legalize things. But what you can do is you can end the policing of marijuana laws, basically be like, tell cops, do not ever bring anyone in because they were using marijuana. Okay. Also, you could end sentencing for marijuana crimes. So you're like, even if somehow somebody randomly ends up in the courts, there can be no sentences. You can't send them to jail. You can't fine them. You can't make them go to drug treatment court. There is no sentencing of that. And if you wanted to go even farther, you could end all for the use of all forensic science in relation to marijuana crimes. Now, have you legalized it? Maybe functionally, but not literally. It's not literally legal. The law is still on the books that using marijuana is illegal. And so that's, that is kind of an example. And so, and as you can tell, that then means if you can come up with a net benefit, and I'm not going to repeat this one because it's a little bit long and complicated, but the use of the critique of ending policing and sentencing as opposed to legalizing things, then that would be a nice net benefit for that particular counter plan that just legalizes. And you have the added benefit of saying, your solvency advocate doesn't say we should end the policing of marijuana. It doesn't say we should end the police or the sentencing for marijuana violations. It doesn't say we should end the use of forensic science to convict people of marijuana crimes. It says we should legalize. And so your author actually supports our counter plan, not your plan. And now the only thing you have to do is make sure you've carefully written your counter plan text and that you have a net benefit to it. In this instance, like I said, I think it's probably most likely to be some kind of a critique. Um, okay, and that's, that's another really, I think, just interesting question to think about, um, not just for this lecture, but to talk with your lab leaders about is, are affirmatives that really are about legalizing something? Is ending the policing and sentencing for those things? Are, are there ways on the negative that we could carve out because I do think that's one of the biggest areas of the topic in that, just think about that. If you can, if you can legalize anything, you can, that means any law, anything that's illegal anywhere can now be made, you know, an affirmative by just saying, oh yeah, we make it so you, you know, you can't police that law or you can't sentence people for violation of that law. And so having the legalization counter plan, if you can come up with a net benefit for it, that will help you deal with a whole bunch of different kinds of uh, affirmatives. Okay, again, since this is the advanced counterplan lecture, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about the different types of counterplans, but I just did wanna mention, and it, so the, the first type I have on my list is an advantage counterplan. We talked about this before, where you're not really trying to solve all of the affirmative, you're only trying to solve one of the advantages. 
Um, and oftentimes in that instance, you will uh, acquire your net benefit by impact turning one of the other advantages. You have a counter plan to solve one advantage and you impact turn the second or the third advantage. Plan inclusive counter plans, counter plans that try to do most of the affirmative but not all of the affirmative. I could see, you know, especially with these legalization affirmatives that you might say, all right, we're gonna end the policing and the sentencing of almost all of these things. And then the net benefit might be, so like, for example, you're going to, you're going to legalize the use of marijuana or you're gonna decriminalize the use of marijuana, but every once in a while, the way that we prosecute drug traffickers is by coming up with other things that they, not just drug traffickers, but there are times where prosecuting attorneys try to convict people of crimes that you wouldn't really think is, is what we're trying to get them for. So I think that maybe was a little bit, of, uh, a little bit confusing. And so I'm gonna give you a pretty good example. So it's often really difficult to convict the head of somebody that we think is a part of organized crime because the, the crime boss often tries not to get involved in those kinds of things. Like all the work is done by lower level minions. And so all the, technically all the illegal acts are done by other people. But if you don't take care of you know, the, the people on the ground that are committing these crimes of extortion or arson or drug running or whatever they're doing, those people, um, you, you, can, you can arrest and, and convict thousands of those people, but if you don't deal with the, the head of the organized crime entity, then you're never gonna solve the problem. And so Congress passed some other laws, and in some instances they've gone after them for tax evasion because you know, the, obviously there's, there's not much of a benefit to being the head of a crime family if you don't get to take in lots of profits. And if they reported a small amount of income, but they live in a multi-million dollar home, then the IRS can get them. And so you can keep certain crimes on the books, even though you're oftentimes not going to ever try to convict low level people of those crimes, but instead you're going to try to use those criminal acts that you can prove when you can't prove the real crime that you want to go after. And so I think that there's some kind of good plan inclusive counter plan ground there. Um, and the third one I talked about is counter plans from the author. Um, I've already talked about this, so I'm not going to say anything else about that. And then the final one I have on my list is uniqueness counter plans, where you have a disadvantage, um, even though this is a terrible disadvantage, and maybe this is all the more reason why you'll need uniqueness counter plans is the fear of crime disadvantage. Is that's kind of what, you know, 25 years ago, that, that's what the, the, the topic authors would say is your core negative ground on this topic, that if we start um, making it things easier on criminals, then people will start to be, they'll start to have a fear of crime. And then, you know, there's, there's impacts to that. Well, there's already a big fear of crime. And so that disadvantage isn't particularly unique. And so you might do things like, to create uniqueness for those counter plans, like give more money to the police and give more money for prisons and give more money for prosecuting attorneys. And that way you can create uniqueness for your disadvantage that is otherwise um, not unique. Anybody have anything else on their list of counter plans that they expected me to talk about, but I have yet to do so. Okay, great. Um, so next I wanted to kind of talk about the strategy of the counter plan just real quickly. And that's, uh, for the two and R and that is just remember most of the time your, your two and R should either be the counter plan or the case. And I have a lecture that I'm going to post pretty soon. That's called reality moments and reality moments is about recognizing, Hey, do we have a counter plan that actually solves this affirmative? Like, okay, yes, we have a DA, we have a net benefit to it, but are we gonna spend a lot of our two and our time on a counter plan? And I'll just kind of say in some of the debates I've already seen um, about the drug treatment affirmative, the state's counter plan doesn't have a particularly, as written, doesn't have a particularly good answer to the argument that a lot of the drug treatment that's required requires drugs that are illegally, are illegal at the federal level and so no doctor will prescribe them. So you could even have the states make drugs legal. You could have the states spend 
billions of dollars on treatment programs and other kinds of things like that. But if you don't have the federal government legalize the use of some of the drugs needed for treatment, then no doctor is going to prescribe those drugs. If that happens in a debate and that argument is effectively extended in the 1AR and the 2RNR doesn't have a particularly good answer to that, they have a problem. And you have to accept the reality of the situation that you're in, and maybe you need to go for your case arguments. Now, if you're going to go for the case, the same thing applies. Like you don't want to, you don't want to spend time going, oh well, I think our counterplan might solve, but I'm a little bit worried about it, so I'm going to go for the case. And the primary reason for that, again, to reference back to Nick's lecture, is you need offense. You need a net benefit for your counterplan. If you do not win your net benefit, your chances of winning the debate are extremely low. And so your first priority has to be winning your net benefit. So generally speaking, your 2NR order is the disadvantage or could be the internal net benefit if you have one, or it could be the impact turns on the other advantage. But however you shake it, your offense should probably be first in your 2NR. And then you make a choice about, are we going to go for the counter plan or are we going to go for the case? And, and rarely both. Now, are there exceptions to this? And especially if you're a highly technical debater and you, you want to go for like a case argument, that, can that be done? Yes. But if you're still, you know, if you're, if let's just say you're like early level varsity debater, we're not, let's just put it this way. If you think that you're one of the top 5% of the teams in the country, then the strategy to go for the DA, the counter plan and a couple case arguments, I'm sure that many, you know, you're, you're in a category where you can do that. Most of the experience that I've had with the other 95% of high school debaters in the country is they end up not spending enough time on the disadvantage so they don't win their net benefit or they drop a permutation and, and it just becomes a mess. And so you're just better off to make a choice. Should we go for the counter plan or should we go for the case? Because your first, if you lose the counter plan and you lose the case, but you win your DA, you might still win the debate. If you don't win your DA, you're going to almost always lose. And so, and well, let's just rephrase. If you don't win your net benefit, you're almost always going to lose. And so that has to be your first priority. The counter plan or the case is your second priority. Just a real quick discussion about potential net benefits as kind of review. We've talked about the politics disadvantage. Um, we've talked about impact turning an advantage you don't solve. We talked about how the critique can sometimes be a net benefit to a counter plan. Occasionally, some other topic DA will be a net benefit. Um, be, you know, like we, we talked about the uh, trade-off disadvantage that's a part of the neg against the treatment affirmative and the advantage to a mutually exclusive counter plan um, occasionally will create an internal net benefit. Or if you have a tricky process counter plan, you might have an internal net benefit. Um, those, those that's kind of just a broad outline of possibilities for creating net benefits for your counter plan. Um, all right. I am going to talk very, very quickly about conditionality. Um, and I am going to kind of make a little bit of an argument here for how oftentimes I think that debaters overuse conditionality a lot of times. And especially on this topic, I think I'm going to see a lot of debates this year where I look at the app, I listen to the one and see, and I'm like, you cannot win without the counter plan or the critique in the two and R. Like that DA is just not good enough that you're ever going to win a debate on that with the DA and the case. And you didn't spend enough time on the case. So it's not going to happen for you. In which case, if you know before the debate, like if you look, and again, this is a pre round reality moment, you look at your partner and you're like, what do we think? we're going to go for in the two and R like, well, I think we're going to go for the D and the counter plan. Okay, great. Can we go for the D and the case? Well, if we do that, we're in serious trouble because our case arguments aren't that good. The app is pretty good and our DA isn't great. Okay. Well then why would you read your counter plan conditionally? Like you have to have it. And so in that instance, sometimes, and in, in the other instances, I've seen debates where debaters ran a counter plan conditionally. I heard the one in seen, I was like, it's dumb. And then they ended up kicking the counter plan and they lost and they kind of knew afterwards. They're like, yeah, we should have gone for the counter plan. It's like, yes, that's one other benefit to it is like, 
if if you make a choice and there's a really good um like video out there by scott Dethridge, who was the debate coach at northwestern by like clearly you know the most successful debate coach in history they won more ndts than any other college program while he was there and he has a lecture out there about choosing you have to make choices and in this instance if you read your counter plan unconditionally and by the way he in his judging philosophy did not let debaters run conditional counter plans he required that if you ran a counter plan it be unconditional um, so in front of him but even as a coach he he would his big thing and this like this lecture that i was talking about is about making choices and you have to make choices just like we were talking about the two and r you can't go for the counter plan the case and the disadvantage and be successful most of the time. And in this instance, reading your counterplan conditionally just means you have options. And, and Duck thought, and I think, um, that it's better to just say, you know what, we're gonna win this counterplan no matter what. And is our, our opponents gonna have answers to it? Yes, but at the end of the day, we are going to need this counterplan to, to win the debate. So instead of trying to come up with four or five different strategies that we can put in the one and see, and if they say this, we'll kick this and all that kind of thing, just figure out your best strategy and make that strategy as good as you can and commit to it. Okay, uh, rant about conditionality over. Um, there are also times, I, I will say one other, I guess one little thing is in a rant about that, but just like a little strategic tip for that, is there are times you can go for your counter plan as long as it doesn't link to the DA, you can say your two and R can be like the counter plan. It's unconditional. We're going for it. Uh, it ain't very good. And that's okay. Cause we're going to win the DA outweighs in terms of the case anyway. So technically you've gone for the counter plan, but you're not going to spend any time on it. And that's, that's another reason. It's like, if you're worried, if you're worried that your disadvantage might link to your counter plan, then this is a terrible strategy. And, you know, you need a better strategy. But if you're very confident that you're going to win, that the counterplan doesn't lead to the disadvantage, then you can make it unconditional. And even if you don't spend any time on it in the two and R, it's still in the debate, therefore unconditional. It's just you don't need it to win the debate. Okay. Um, uh, anybody have any questions about that? I'm almost at my time limit for this section. And when I come back, um, we're going to we're going to uh, talk about affirmative against counterplans, unless anybody has questions before we take an, another short break. Good. All right, let's take five minutes and be back at 8.20 Eastern, 7.20 Dallas time. And again, if you think of things on break, you can throw them in the chat, that's cool. Um, I'm also going to take a short break, but I'll be but I'll be back and and I'll answer those questions when I get back. All right, seven twenty in Dallas, eight twenty on the East Coast, and we're back. So let's start with. Um, Let's, I didn't see any questions in the doc and I don't see any, or in the chat and I don't see anybody with their hand up. So um, we'll start with the section of the lecture about the affirmative answering counter plans. Um, and the first thing I'm going to just kind of say, because we talk about this a lot early on about the affirmative uh, or about the negative and their agent counter plan option, options, like the uh, you know executive order and stuff. Do not specify your agent. It is almost never a good idea. The topic says United States federal government. You don't have to specify beyond that, and you almost never should. There are there are exceptions. You know, debate is debate. There are very few, if any, rules in debate. Um, and so, and I also am not fond of absolutes. Having said that, in general. The way that debate works these days, it is in your best interest not to specify your agent. Your plan text should say United States federal government. If you don't do that, 
there's a host of counter plans that are going to cause you a bunch of problems. Um, so next we're going to move into the acronym for answering counter plans. We're going to go through this pretty fast because um, this is the advanced counter plan lecture, but I did just want to mention it. Hold on, I see a question. Okay, so so yeah, I, I knew we wouldn't be able to avoid the A spec like uh, you know questions. So Michelle's like, if they ask in cross examination, do you say usage, or you at the United States federal government, um, and you say that is correct, and you can say other things, and and so some people, depending on how cross X goes, are going to be like really adamant about this. I think it's okay to say normal means. It's like normal means is likely to be X or normal means is likely or our solvency advocate talks about this. So if you are looking and, and a lot of times I think it's clear that they're just trying to set up these counter plans. And so you can just preempt that and say, look, if you want to read a disadvantage about Congress, we've read evidence that said Congress would, would be a way that our plan could be done. It's not the only way, but it is a way and we'll defend that for, for purposes of your disadvantage. But if you are trying to set up a counter plan, we are going to say permutation, do the counter plan. Um, that there's a variety of different strategies and different coaches have different ways that they suggest that you do that. Um, our assistant coach, Jason Peterson is fond of our plan speaks for itself. I don't like that very much. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's just strategic choices and some judges are super sympathetic. And they understand, look, if you're forced to specify your agent in cross-examination, then the negative is just going to read an agent counter plan. And we aren't going to really debate about all the ways that the criminal justice system is messed up and what we should do about it. We're just going to debate about whether or not Congress should do the plan or Congress or the court should do the plan or the executive branch should do the plan. And so my, uh, is that enough, Michelle? We good on this? We can, and we can talk more about it later if you all want, but for now, I'll, I'll move on. Thank you. Okay, um, so, so when answering counter plans, a lot of times the uh, people like want to make, coaches want to make sure that you make a variety of different arguments against the counter plan. And so they say you should think of answering counter plans with the acronym of STOP. Um, I prefer POST only because I want you to be sure and make a permutation almost every time. And so if you think about when you are answering counter plans, you want to make a permutation. You want to have offense against the counter plan. You want to try to make solvency deficits against the counter plan. And you often want to have theory arguments against the counter plan. I don't really like theory debates. And so I, I wish I could, I guess I could make my acronym POTS. I don't know why I didn't actually in, in the future. Um, no, that doesn't help me. It, oh, actually, you're right. I, I'm sorry. I confused myself. Part of the reason I like post is because I want theory last because most of the time I prefer you not make theory arguments and I want perm first because I want you to make that. So the, or because I do want you to make permutations in almost every debate. Um, the, This topic is different in that, especially against the state's counter plan, there will be times where you have to go for theory. And this is, I'm not gonna talk about this much because again, it'll be covered in the state's counter plan lecture, but the Lopez counter plan, like when, when all else fails, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of say right now that 99% of the time, the state's counter plan can solve your affirmative. It's just a question of how theoretically abusive they need to be to do it. And the first step down that path is Lopez. Lopez basically says, and uh, Mr. Katyal mentioned this the other day, which by the way, side note, how awesome is it that he comes and talks to the Georgetown uh, summer program almost every year? He is incredible. Like there, we couldn't ask for a better ambassador for debate. Somebody that's like, the things that I do now I got into and I'm better at because of what debate gave me. And it was the most important thing for me so that because I want to help people who haven't been as fortunate or as privileged as I have been. Um, I mean, I, I love that. So he 
talked about Lopez, but if you need a quick refresher, that's basically just the idea of what other, whatever area of criminal activity that the affirmative deals with, you just say, we're gonna give that to the states. The United States federal government will devolve all of their authority over this area, give it to the states, and then the states will mimic the plan. That counter plan is very likely to solve many, many, many affirmatives on this topic. However, they have also, also taken the first step down the theoretically illegitimate route because they are now multi-actor fiat. They are both federal government action and action at the state level. And so even if we think that the negative should get fiat over all 50 states and sub-federal entities, it feels like maybe they shouldn't also get federal government action. And so, and I, and I think that while generally speaking, I don't like to listen to theory debates, this is another place where there will be reality moments, but no Mahoney lecture on reality moments, that you have to say like, this counterpoint solves our affirmative. It just does. And 2A, I'm sorry that you spent 100 hours on this affirmative and you think it's awesome, but you are not gonna beat this state's counter plan with solvency deficits. They're gonna solve our app. Therefore, we have to either make theory arguments or we have to impact turn their net benefit. And that is the O in post, that our offense is um, going to be impact turning that. So uh, Jay has jumped in with how is multi-actor fiat distinct from fiat in a perm? Yeah, well, so permutations are really just tests of competition. They're a method by determining whether or not, and I guess we could just, if you, if you didn't know this already and you want to write it down in your notes, the first part of post is permutation. Permutations are tests of competition. Is this counter plan competitive with us? Can we combine the act, actions of the plan and the actions of the counter plan in a net beneficial way? So the, I guess it's the same, the, the whole basis of theory, and if you need kind of a refresher on this, I haven't watched uh, Daisy's lecture um, on counter plans yet, but it, it probably has some stuff on that. And if not, um, you know, ask your lab leaders about it. But the gist of permutations is we don't think that teams should lose to the counter plan um, that, you know, like the Feed Africa counter plan. Like, is it possible the Feed Africa counter plan like saves more lives than the, the affirmative does? Yes. Should the affirmative lose to the Feed Africa counter plan when those things could be done together? No. Therefore, we allow the affirmative to combine things. So whatever the... Um, uh, oh, sorry, Jason, this to me privately, but so don't bother doing that because I won't, I, if you really don't want me to talk about your question, um, then you'll have to hold it and put it in the uh, anonymous questions document or, or send me an email or something. Um, sorry, Jay. Um, anyway, the, the, for purposes of the permutation, the affirmative is allowed to combine whatever, whatever elements their plan fiatted and whatever elements that counter plan has fiatted. But that's, and it's also the same kind of thing of if, if it's true that multi-actor fiat is illegitimate, then the negative should lose their Lopez counter plan. So you're okay. You're like, yes, it's true. Our permutation is illegitimate. For that same reason, your counter plan is also illegitimate. Um, let's see. Yeah, so... The question has come up about textual competition. And so this is, in my opinion, textual competition is, is just a kind of like meaningless thing. It's, it's total nonsense. Um, it's the, the, the only true test of competition is either it's mutually exclusive, which is often overused and rarely actually true. Like very rarely to be mutually exclusive, it literally has to be opposite actions. Like the affirmative, uh, legalizes marijuana and the negative is like we are going to make it illegal and can and enforce the penalties even more strictly and even that is well that that's a good enough example we'll accept that and textual competition is all just about is kind of like a semantic word game and I don't think that that is a, a true test of whether or not a counter plan is relevant it's a question of if you can't win that your counter plan is functionally competitive or mutually exclusive, then, then your counterplan isn't competitive. Um, 
and so part of that question is um let's see yeah if that didn't answer your question whoever asked that question just throw something so throw something else in there um yeah so so the next question that I got was that there's so many different agents that the negative will try to use um, to solve different affirmatives. Like what, how does the 2A prepare for that? And so I, I think the answer to that question is you do want to try to start with having a good federal key warrant. Um, and like I said, I do think that even though I recognize that the, at the end of the day, if they really want to use their counter plan to solve your affirmative, they'll be able to, um, but for the most part, the first check on that is don't specify beyond the United States federal government. That's really my answer. That the 2A prepares for answering all these agent counter plans by saying our affirmative does not specify which actors in the United States federal government should do the plan. Instead, we, we recognize that there's certain actions that our plan does that will link us to disadvantages, but those that is not the only way that the United States federal government could do our plan. And I think most of the other agent counterplans other than the states is, um, isn't a problem like the, 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 those that, but that's the only way you can deal with those things now. And actually that's not true. Learn to impact turn politics. Like the most common net benefits for those types of counterplans is going to be politics. Um, and after like impact turning with Trump good, I mean, I guess you can do that. That's a, that's a little dicier, but the election will be over pretty soon. And then we'll be back to the normal atrocious, uh, you know, congressional politics kinds of disadvantages. And when that happens, I, as a 2A, I would definitely be prepared to impact turn in the 2AC. And then just to continue down that path, that makes 1AR strategy. So like in the 2AC, you're still gonna do all the same other stuff that you normally do. You're gonna say permutation. You're gonna to try to use your best, you know, whatever that actor fails. And um, I'm gonna stop here real quick. Sorry to kind of make this tangent, but I did want to say the reason why these counterplans almost always solve if the negative really wants them to is fiat. Is and this is very frustrating. And when I talk to the so I'm doing the basic lecture for the novice for the states counterplan and. The, it's very frustrating when you find cards that you think are quite good that the federal government should do your plan and that there's, it sounds like you have lots of fed key warrants, but the problem is fiat. The negative is going to have the states do things that they've never, ever really done, never, ever really would do. And all of your authors are talking about things that the states are unlikely to do. Therefore, the federal government should do it but the negative is just going to fiat over those things. And so you're still going to make those arguments in the 2AC against some of these agent counter plans. You're going to say permutation do the counter plan. And you're going to make theory arguments against the counter plan, like agent counter plans bad. And you're going to try to create offense in some other ways. And my suggestion is your offense needs to come from impact turning at least one or two impact turns in the 2AC. So then the 1AR has basically three choices. They can go for permutation through the counter plan. They can go for the impact turns on the net benefit, or they can go for theory because they're probably, and again, this is back to our reality moments. Probably should have made watching my reality moments lecture a precondition of being in this lecture. You have to have a reality moment of, the negative has fiated so much stuff, or they've written one of those big counter plans that Mahoney told them to write, they just flat out solve our affirmative. So the only way that we can beat them is on permutation do the counter plan. And can we win that? Are we gonna win that it's that we haven't severed something or that that permutation is intrinsic or whatever? And have a reality moment about that. Are we gonna win the theory that the counter plan is unfair because it's multi-agent. Do we have a judge that ran Lopez a thousand times and we're never going to vote on it? Or are we going to have to impact her in the net benefit? And so you want to give the 1AR all of those options in your 2AC um, so they can then make choices then. They shouldn't go for all of those things, but maybe it's a very short shadow extension of permutation do the counter plan, theory, 
And, and actually, I'm going to say one thing about that just because I'm running out of time and I want to make sure I get this. Don't just make every theory or argument you have make targeted theory arguments. So don't just say multi-actor fiat is bad. Say conditional multi-actor fiat is bad because our best arguments against their counter plan are solvency deficits that if we make, they can kick the counter plan and then use those arguments against us. And so we're not just making arguments that are the same old blocks that judges have heard a thousand times, like multi-actor fiat unfair, state fiat unfair, opportunity cost proves the negative doesn't even get fiat. Instead, make a very specific theory argument against that particular counter plan so that the 1AR can say, they just read their generic conditionality, good argument, but our argument is this conditionality in this method is particularly bad. And so that should be more than enough of an answer to the how does the 2A prepare for that? And it also helps us get through a big chunk of our um, ways that the affirmative should answer these things. Um, let's see, I have now covered targeted theory arguments. I have covered reality moments about recognizing when you need to impact turn the counter plan. Um, I have a few examples of um, like how you can make your 50 states counter plan really abusive. Um, so like, in, and so I guess we'll go ahead and talk about that. It, it's uh, like, I'm kind of now at the point where I'm just gonna take questions for the, for the rest of this thing. And then I've got a few optional things that, to talk about if you all don't ask questions. So here's like an example of a states counter plan that I wrote that's pretty much gonna solve this, these treatment courts half. The 50 states and relevant sub-federal governments in the United States should undertake various activities to sustain economic growth and combat drug addiction, including but not limited to, create an accreditation program for drug court expansion that requires universal screening, objective metrics for admission, and tiered evidence-based treatment programs, massively increase funding for drug treatment programs available to anyone who seeks treatment, and convince state bar associations to decertify any attorneys prosecuting drug crimes fully legalized drugs and then all cooperation with federal authorities who attempt to prosecute drug crimes, fully fund massive transportation infrastructure and STEM initiatives. That counter plan solves the affirmative, the treatment affirmative. It just does. There's just, there, it's, this includes, and again, this will be covered in um, my states, my basic states counter plan lecture, a thing called uncooperative federalism, where the states go out of their way to um, ignore the um, whatever the federal government says. So for example, <laughs> can I type that out? Um, yeah, um, so I, I have typed it out and I'll, I, sure, I'll put it in the chat, why not? Um, and so, and I kind of, the, the conclusion of that is, and you know, I don't know, let's just say that if you're, if you're a 2A out there, any of you 2As out there, be like, oh, Mahoney's wrong. That kind of like, you want to you wanna throw that in there? Now, you might be able to take it to, I don't know who wrote this app. Um, if you find them or they're, if, you know, depending on which lab you're in, maybe one of your lab leaders worked on it, you can talk to them if that kind of fun falls in that. Um, but I don't, see, I don't see hands flying up. I don't see things in chat. None of the 2As out there yet have figured out um, like how what what the solvency deficit to this counter plan is i'll give you i'll give you a minute if you want oh and i forgot my favorite one and some of you missed this one my favorite one too including but not limited to or maybe i did i'm usually pretty good about that maybe i didn't follow my own instructions which is everybody including but not limited to and also careful plan writing so i actually sent it I said I posted it, but I actually sent it to the last person that asked me a question. So it got sent out privately. Sorry about that. That also gives me the chance to fix it. By putting including but not limited to. Oh, no, I did it. I wouldn't make that kind of mistake. All right, there you go. Sorry about that. So. I'll give you a couple minutes to kind of look through that over. And if you're a 2A, oh, everyone got it. Thank you. Too late. Got it twice now. Um, if you, 
Yeah, if you're a 2A that has been looking into this affirmative and you have a, hey, um, here's my solvency deficit, let's hear it. Otherwise, while you're thinking about that, I will just repeat what I said before, which is you need to have a reality moment with yourself and say, whoever wrote this app isn't here to help me. Don't know how we're going to beat this counter plan. And therefore, and by the way, this is another reason to read your counter plan unconditionally because I have, I have literally seen debates where the 2A is listening to the counter plan and they're very, very rapidly talking to their partner and from the nonverbals and the, and the massive hand gestures, I can tell that the conversation they're having is this counter plan solves our affirmative. And for example, their net benefit is the elections disadvantage with Trump bad impacts. Our ability to impact her, this is limited because guess what? Trump probably isn't good as president. Therefore, and especially in the debate world, the evidence that Trump would be is bad and a second term for Trump would be catastrophic is quite good. Therefore, our ability to win this debate by impact turning elections is low. Our ability to win on solvency deficit is virtually zero. How are we gonna win this debate? First cross X question of the one and C, what's the status of the counter plan? Conditional, big sigh of relief from the two AC because now they know they're gonna go for, if the, if, the, if the neg tries to go for the counter plan, the affirmative is going to beat them on conditionality. And they otherwise had no offense. And so that's, this kind of a counter plan is devastating and you are forcing the affirmative team to either impact turn your net benefit. And if you have a good net benefit that you're willing to defend, you're not worried about that and or go for theory. And, um, you know, they can't, this particular counter plan, they cannot be with permutation B the counter plan because that would be severance. So they are left with theory and the more theoretically illegitimate things you do, like making your counter plan conditional, the more you've opened up an opportunity for them to actually win the debate. And why would you do that? Like if you, if that question is answered, the counter plan is unconditional, the 2AC, I've seen literally debates where I thought the 2AC was ready to quit. Like they're just like, we're not going to win. We know we're not going to win. And, and then joy on their face when they find out that the counter plan is conditional, at least they have one argument that they can make. Okay. Nobody has thrown anything in about why this counterplan doesn't solve the app. Good luck to you affirmative teams that debate this in the future. Go for theory, impact term and benefit. Um, I'm trying, I'm kind of going back through my notes and I really actually think I covered um, everything that I wanted to. Um, and I've got about, that gives us 15 minutes for more questions or other things that you all want to talk about, like any kind of, Counterplan stuff that I didn't get to that you're particularly interested in. And for those of you that kind of showed up late, um, I actually do. If you all don't throw any questions in here, I do actually have one other thing that, that that's just kind of interesting to me that I like to, that I sometimes talk about um, that I'll throw out there. Um, and I was going to kind of review something for those of you that came in late, but when I saw this other thing, it got me thinking of, I wanted to talk about that instead. Let's see. All right, I got some questions coming in now. So some of the, you can make, you can make theory arguments depending on how much of the plan that they do. Um, the question is just like, what other theory arguments can we make? So there's conditionality, multi-actor fiat, Picks bad, agent counter plans bad, um, those 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 kinds of things. They like this one's this one's a real stretch. But there was a long time where people thought that topical counter plans were unfair. It was kind of based in this notion that the affirmative gets the circle of ground that's the topic, and the negative gets everything outside of that. You know, you're you're really up against it if you're going for a topical counter plans bad. But debates have been won on that. Um, and just and, and just to talk a little bit more about conditionality and kind of like why it's particularly abusive in this instance. So, you know, recognizing that conditionality means that at any point in time, the negative team can say, 
we don't, we don't want to talk about this anymore. That counterplan goes away. That is particularly unfair when the affirmative's best arguments against the counterplan are also reasons why their plan might be a bad idea. Um, and therefore, when the 2AC makes their best arguments against the counterplan, those arguments may prove that the plan is better than the counterplan, but they might also prove that the status quo is better than the plan. And that's, that means, and, and so to kind of talk about the theory, one of the theoretical arguments for justifying conditionality is it creates better policymaking. And the affirmative can say, this type of counterplan is uniquely bad policymaking because we can't actually make our best arguments between the plan and the counterplan because we also have to be worried that the negative will defer back to the status quo. Um, let's see. Anything else? Okay, I still got a few minutes. Um, so I this one this one's kind of you know like this we'll we'll put this in the category of Mahoney's crazy ideas, but um, I kind of like um, the so I I really I have a the last section of my document is called types of competition functional textual and philosophical and I already basically said I think textual is nothing it's just like semantic nonsense if your counterpart is not functionally competitive you should lose did have a little, there was a topic, um, uh, social services topic of a few years back. And a really important part of that topic was about how people get um, social services. Like you have to be what's called means tested and means tested means that if you don't, if you make more than X amount of money, then you're not eligible for certain social services programs. And there were really, really good debates in the literature about whether or not we should means test programs or not. Um, and it kind of got me thinking that philosophical competition should maybe be a thing. And the reason, I, I hope that's enough of a description about that. Um, and I'm gonna apply it to this topic now, which is part of the, like the abolish, whether or not you call it the critique or the counterplan, but whatever, like the negative is just like, instead of making a small reform, we should just abolish the entire system and it's bad. I, I could see myself being convinced by negatives that even though it maybe doesn't seem functionally competitive, like it, it probably isn't that the plan is, is, you know, like especially if the plan is legalized marijuana or whatever. And the negative is like, we should just abolish the whole criminal justice system. They're like you cannot abolish the entire criminal justice system without legalizing marijuana. So this isn't competitive with us. But I, I could see that it might be philosophically competitive. It's just like the arguments are, so where it's not functionally competitive, it's philosophically competitive. And in general, in my heart of hearts, that's probably bad for debate. But because of that, that topic where really the provision of social services was means tested. And so counter plans that said we should just like, like do some provide services, but not call them social services because they're means tested felt like it felt like a good debate to have whether or not that applies exactly in this instance. Like I, I'm still trying to decide whether or not, um, well, no, I think there are good debates about whether or not we should legalize marijuana or focus our efforts on abolishing the criminal justice system, even if those things aren't functionally competitive. And so, you know, I'm not saying the next time I judge you be like, yes, our kind of fun isn't really competitive. It's philosophically competitive and that's a automatic win for you. But I, but I have some sympathy for this. Now, you know, that's definitely a minority opinion. That's why it's at the end of this lecture and, you know, during the question and answer period. Uh, but, you know, I just thought it's kind of like an interesting thing. And at least a part of camp should be able to be more than just like, here's the nuts and bolts of a counter plan. Make sure you permit, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's see what else I've got here. Okay, so this is a, this is a great question. So. How many, how many planks is too many for your counterplan? So it's too many if you put one in that links to your net benefit. It's probably too many, um, depends on what your judge thinks about conditionality and whether or not you think your counterplan is one entity or like that counterplan that I put in there that's got a lot of planks to it. And in general, if I say that that counterplan is unconditional, I think that resolves a lot of the too many questions. But there is a question like if you said, is the counter plan conditional? I said yes, and then you followed that question up with, can you kick individual planks? 
And the reason you might want to do that, you might say, if you're negative, you might say, yes, we can, can, we might kick the, you know, fully legalized drugs and end all cooperation with federal authorities who attempt to prosecute drug crimes, because that's a pretty big thing to do. And the AF might have DAs to that. So I might want to kick that. Well, that proves why conditionality can be abusive. And this counter plan in particular, instead of having, if I said the counter plan is one thing and we have to go for all of it or go for none of it, that is a far less abusive conditional advocacy than an advocacy where I say, I can kick any one of those planks at any time and go for the other 47 things that we do. I think that's the most important question. Um, but that's, so other than that, I don't think there are too many. As long as you don't, you know, if, you're, if your counter plan does 37 things and it's all unconditional, then that's probably fine. Now, if one of those planks is federal action and all the others are state, now we've got some theoretical concerns. If it links to our net benefit, we got a huge problem. So that's a bad idea. But beyond that, that's, you know, I started with, hey, when you're running your counter plan, why not make your counter plan big? Do a lot of stuff. Just always be clear on what your net benefit is and be aware of the theoretical implications of it. Excuse me. Uh, anybody else? We good? Hour and 53 minutes in. All right, well, um, you know, I'd say thank you for your attention, but I have no idea since I have no, no visible viewers. I have no idea what you all have been up to. Um, I, I hope it's been good. It's like a new experience for me and um, it's been recorded. And so who knows what this recording looks like. Thank you. I'm getting a few thumbs up and, uh, and that, and I appreciate it. Um, I hope you all had a good time. I hope camp is going well for you. And, um, you know, if you, if you have other questions, uh, fire on my way when you get a chance. Uh, Y'all are welcome and, and feel free to leave and uh, yeah. And the recording will be posted at some time if you, if you missed parts of it and you want to go back to it. And y'all are welcome. You're, Thank uh, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.